Um, our next speaker is uh, Michael Sanders. He's a doctoral candidate in the history department of Fordham University in New York City. His paper today comes out of his dissertation directed by Dr. Nicholas Paul uh, about the role of Jerusalem in Iberian political culture, how it shaped identity, kingship, and military plans from the 12th to the early 16th centuries in Castile León and Catalonia, Aragon. Prior to his studies at Fordham, he earned a BA in history and English at St. Vincent College in La Trobe, Pennsylvania, and an MA in history at Western Michigan University under the direction of Dr. Larry Simon, another presenter this weekend conference. Uh, Michael also works as a copy editor for the academic journal Renaissance Quarterly, for which he previously served as book reviews manager. So let's welcome Michael. Uh, before getting started, I just want to thank the organizers of this conference um, and the presenters. Uh, it's so nice to be at an event um, with so many of the scholars that I use in my own work. <laughs> it's very nice to meet you. Um, and also um, to have the opportunity to talk about a theme um, so important, not only um, to my research, but also teaching. Um, and to have the motivation to talk about some topics that are um, a little tangential to my area of expertise. So please bear with me. In early 2019, Excuse me, in early 1219, the Fifth Crusade had reached the walls of Damietta, an important center of power in the Nile Delta for the Ayyubid dynasty who ruled Egypt and the Holy Land in and around the city of Jerusalem. The new Ayyubid Sultan, al Kamil, whose predecessor and father, El Adil I, had recently died, according to some accounts, from the shock of the Crusaders' conquest of the chain tower in the Nile, tried to end the siege of Damietta diplomatically. In exchange for a 30-year truce, an extraordinary concession considering most Islamic jurists would allow at most 10-year truces with non-Muslims, El Kamil offered to surrender all of the territory except Transjordan that his dynasty's founder, the famed Kurdish general Saladin, had taken from the Crusader kingdoms of Jerusalem about 40 years ago. The Crusaders refused, however. The Sultan then sweetened the offer by adding a rent of 15,000 bizants a year for the castles of Karak and Sharbok and Transjordan. The Crusaders again refused. El Kamil then made an even more generous deal by offering the relic of the True Cross, as well as payment for the rebuilding of the walls of Belvoir, Safad, and Toron castles, in addition to the city of Jerusalem's walls, which his predecessor Saladin had torn down. Yet once more, the Crusaders refused. Ultimately, Damietta would fall, but the Fifth Crusade would end in failure less than a year later, after the Crusaders were trapped by the Ayyubids' flooding of the Nile outside the city of Mansoura. Historians still debate why the Crusaders did not accept El Kamil's generous terms. The whole point of conquering Egypt was to free Jerusalem from Ayyubid control and restore the kingdom of Jerusalem, which Saladin had conquered. Moreover, some Crusaders, most notably the expedition's secular head, the titular king of Jerusalem, John of Brienne, were in favor of the truce. But the spiritual head of the crusade, the papal legate Peleo of Galvani, was not. Perhaps the cardinal thought El Camille's siblings, instead of the sultan, had control of Jerusalem. He really didn't have that relic of the true cross that he promised. Or the Ayyubids would quickly retake the city if Egypt was not conquered. Or, as Stephen Runciman described, he was, quote, a haughty, tactless, and unpopular man, end quote, whose religious obstinacy led to a tactical short-sightedness. The mid-13th century chronicle of Tours, however, includes a much less studied reason. Quote, a certain book discovered among the enemy's spoils especially influenced Peleo. In it was contained that the law of Muhammad would last only 600 years, which would end in the month of June and that one would come from the Spanish kingdoms who would abolish it completely. Therefore, the legate who had been born in Spain deemed the book most true, end quote. The Chronicle's author, Peon Gastineau, thus attributes Peleo's refusal to an apocalyptic book with nationalist prophecies. Well, this book was known to many authors, such as Jacques de Vitry, William of Tripoli, and Fidenzio of Padua, and stimulated religious polemics well into the 14th century, Gastineau seems to have been mocking Peleo's gullibility with this explanation. As its name implies, the Chronicle of Tours advocated fresh interests and criticized the kingdom's rivals. At one point during its recounting of the Fifth Crusade, 
Gastineau complains the Spanish and Gascons, quote, would not stop their polite chatter, end quote, while the humble French valiantly assailed the enemy. He did not take Spanish involvement in the crusade seriously, and until recently, thanks to the efforts of several people at this conference, neither did modern scholars. Reconquista and Convivencia dominated scholarship on the Iberian Middle Ages. Spanish historians like Claudio Sanchez Elbernaz denied crusading had anything to do with the peninsula. And even when Jonathan Riley Smith, Joseph O'Callaghan, and other members of the pluralist school showed the Reconquista was part of the wider crusade movement, little attention has been paid to attitudes towards Jerusalem, either by peninsular Christians, Muslims, or Jews. The delayed response to the First Crusade in the Islamic world and figures like al Kamil, who offered to surrender Jerusalem and indeed did surrender the city, uh, or rather its holy sites in 1229 to the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, made Jerusalem or al Quds seem unimportant in Islamic culture. In Iberia, moreover, Andalusian exceptionalism for both Muslims and Jews was based largely on court culture, which scholars have fervently emphasized partly to combat nationalist myths arising from these groups' expulsions in the later Middle Ages and early modern period. Jerusalem did not fit neatly into this secular paradigm, for its significance when discussed usually rested on its spiritual value. For Jews, it was the capital of the United Israelite Kingdom and then Judea, as well as the site of the Jewish temples built by Solomon and Herod. For Christians, the main setting of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. For Muslims, it was the place where Muhammad ascended to heaven, either in person or in a vision during his night journey. These spiritual significance, of course, are well known. Less studied, however, is the city's political importance for medieval Iberians. I argue that the physical city of Jerusalem became increasingly important for peninsular Jews, Muslims, and Christians during the 11th and 12th centuries as a result of the crusading movement. This paper analyzes discussion of each group's plans to control the city, or what I call Jerusalemite discourses for short. While sparked by Christian crusading, these discourses were not identical, and my goal, like that of the global Middle Ages in general, is to put these three perspectives in communication. Christendom, Sephirot, and El Andalus each designed their own road to Jerusalem, Zion, and El Quds, and made the city much closer in medieval minds than geography would suggest. Let us begin with Christendom's road to Jerusalem. Joshua Prower has traced during the Middle Ages the destination of this road buried between the spiritual Jerusalem, advocated in Paul's letter to the Galatians, Book of Revelation and Gospels, and the early Jerusalem visited by travelers such as St. Helena, the Bordeaux Pilgrim, Egeria, and others. Except under certain periods, such as the reign of Constantine, though, the spiritual Jerusalem seemed to always take priority as an Augustan city of God. It would continue to be espoused over its temporal twin during the high Middle Ages, especially the monastic communities like the Cistercians. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, in fact, urged an English cleric to abandon his pilgrimage to the Holy Land and for uh, and venture for the real Jerusalem in Clairvaux. But Bernard also wrote the rule for the Knights Templar and served as the chief organizer of the Second Crusade. While defending the traditional Pauline interpretation of Jerusalem, he also represents a popular shift caused by the Crusades to focus on the physical Jerusalem across the sea. This shift also occurred in the Iberian Peninsula and was perhaps best illustrated by Beatus manuscripts. As is well known, these manuscripts originated in an Asturian monk, Beatus of Libana's commentary on the Apocalypse. Completed in 776, this text's numerous illuminations garnered great popularity, and the work was widely recopied in a variety of places and styles throughout the Middle Ages. Today, 29 complete manuscripts survive, along with fragments from another 12. The initial manuscripts followed a Mozarabic style, which reflected the Arabic culture Christians had adopted living in and beyond Al Andalus. The depiction of the heavenly Jerusalem in the 10th century Beatus, there we go, from San Salvador de Tabera, as Julia Peritori has shown in her excellent exhibit over a year ago, thus naturally mirrors Andalusian architecture, especially with its horseshoe arches for the city's famed 12 gates and its vivid colors. When the artist and scribe Maeus wanted to depict the most important site in Christian theology, he clearly used the most impressive site of his own day, 
the Umayyad capital of Cordoba. Yet his choice reflected a concern not only for style and the Mises, but also for spirituality. What mattered to him was not the physical city that early medieval Iberian pilgrims, such as Martin of Braga, Bishop Torbus of Astorga, Count Azario Gutierrez, and others had visited, but the heavenly Jerusalem described by Beatos of Labana in his commentary. Some maps in Beatus' manuscripts similarly show a lack of interest in the terrestrial Jerusalem as well as the spiritual city. While well, TO maps, like the famous one from St. Isidore's Etymologies, often depict Jerusalem prominently in the center, the city receives varied attention in the Mappa Mundi that most Beatus' manuscripts contain. This later Beatus' manuscript, composed at the monastery of Santa Maria la Real in Burgos around 1220, does not give much attention to Jerusalem. It is pictured, but it is off-center and smaller in comparison to its antithesis, Babylon. This V, uh, excuse me, this V and square map, which divides the three known medieval continents with a V instead of a T shape, comes from Beato's given to Fernando I and his wife, Donna Sancha, in 1047. It neither depicts nor even lists the name of Jerusalem within it, but rather describe which of Noah's sons received each continent and their climate. This last example, however, is definitely the proverbial exception to the rule. Most Beate and by extension Iberians had a concern about Jerusalem, but after the first crusade, the concern shifted from the spiritual to the earthly city. The best evidence of this shift is the Ir per Hispanium. the way through Spain to Jerusalem. It is perhaps best known through the early 14th century treatises of the Majorcan mystic missionary and philosopher, Ramon Lull. Writing after the fall of Acre in 1291, Lull advised recovering Christian rule in the Holy Land by first finishing the conquest of El Andalus, then conquering the Barbary Coast or North Africa and Egypt, and finally after establishing the strong supply, supply line from Iberia to the Holy Land, taking Jerusalem and its environs. Lull was criticized by his medieval contemporaries as well as modern commentators for many, quote, extravagant and extreme, unquote, ideas, not the least of which was his Neoplatonic philosophy known as the art. So the Iter per Hispanium might seem like one of his idiosyncratic ideas, but it was actually well established by his time. Bishop Diego Gelmirez of Santiago de Compostela first promoted this idea at a regional church council in 1124 when he implored his listeners, quote, and just as soldiers of Christ and faithful sons of Holy Church open the way to Jerusalem with much labor and much shedding of blood, so also let us prove ourselves soldiers of Christ, and after the Saracens, his worst enemies, are subdued, let us, with Christ's grace as our aid, open a way which is shorter and much less laborious through the regions of Spain to the same sepulcher of the Lord. The concern here is clearly the earthly Jerusalem, which the First Crusade violently conquered, and where the Holy Sepulcher lies. Although the papacy and preachers would often remind listeners that crusading ultimately would lead to the heavenly city via martyrdom. Nevertheless, the Iter per Hispanium is intended as a physical route, and later iterations of it, like Lull's, had more specific directions and had specific cities. Indeed, it is not clear if Gelmirez envisioned a land route across North Africa or a sea route across the Mediterranean, since it is hard to comprehend how the former could ever be considered, quote, shorter and much less laborious. Regardless, Gelmirez used the new interest in the Holy Land, which kept luring Iberian Christians across the sea, as a number of well-known papal bulls have attested, to redirect fighters against the Almoravid and Elmoha dynasties in the Maghrib. Neither Gelmirez nor other Christians were the only writers participating in the renewed Jerusalemite discourses following the First Crusade. The city became a rallying point for Muslims, too, who also included the city in planned routes of holy war. The counter-crusade or jihad against the crusader states in the Levant began in earnest under Nur al-Din. Originally the Atabeg of Aleppo and Mosul, Nur al-Din used Jerusalem to unite the bearish Turkish and Arab provinces of Syria and Egypt into one empire, which would come to fruition under his general and successor Saladin. Studies by Carol Hillenbrand, Jonathan Phillips, and others have shown how the two leaders forged Jerusalemite discourses through epigraphy, architecture, and literature, especially poems on the merits of Jerusalem. The two also redefined ideas of holy war, though, by sponsoring treatises on jihad. Indeed, Saladin's most enthusiastic biographer, Ibn Shaddad, noted, 
If anyone wished to gain his favor, he would urge him to perform the jihad or related some of the traditions of jihad. Numerous books on the jihad were composed for him. I too am one of those who compiled a book on it for him. But Kenneth Goody and Niall Christie have also noted some jihad treatises predated and undoubtedly influenced Nur al-Din and his successor. The 1106 Book of Jihad by Abu al-Hassan Ali ibn Tahir al-Sulami provides a good example of a text in this genre focused on Jerusalem. The city helps al-Sulami reformulate jihad from being primarily an offensive war of expansion to a war of reclamation or defense. He argues that Jerusalem will be the first step toward the conquest of Constantinople, the harbinger of the final judgment which will occur in Al-Quds and the end times. His eschatological scheme shares striking similarities with later recovery treaties by Christian authors like Ramon Lull, Arnold of Villanova, and William of Adam, who placed Jerusalem and Constantinople's conquest in an eschatological paradigm. Although for the Christians, Constantinople was the first step on the road and Jerusalem the destination. The influence of these jihad texts and Saladin's reputation as the restorer of El Quds stretched from the Levant and indeed to the Iberian Peninsula. Saladin relied on the common interests of holy war and Jerusalem's protection to try and convince the Almohad dynasty, led at the time by the third Almohad ruler, Yaqub el Mansur, to grant him naval aid. After their loss at the horns of Hattin, the remnants of the Crusader states laid siege to the city of Acre from 1189 to 91 by land and sea. Saladin tried to relieve the siege, but his weak navy could not supplant the naval blockade nor prevent reinforcements from reaching the besiegers. Ultimately, the Crusaders took the city, which would become the capital of the reduced kingdom of Jerusalem until 1291. Prior to his defeat, Saladin tried to make up for his lack of naval power by sending two letters, one in 1189 and the other in 1290, to El Mansur. The Almohad ruler had developed one of the most powerful navies in the Western Mediterranean to repel Christian naval attacks, especially by the Portuguese who had nearly completed their expansion into the Algarve, and Saladin hoped that, he would lend him, that they would lend him naval assistance by destroying crusade reinforcements coming from Sicily. Ultimately, El Mansur refused, according to some accounts, because Saladin's ambassador would not address him with caliphal titles, such as Prince of the Believers, but most likely because all of his forces were needed in El Andalus. Only a few years later, the Almohads would win their most celebrated victory at Alarcos. Also, Saladin had tried at least until 1187 to conquer the Almohads through his general, Quirkush, and an alliance of the Banu Ghania of Majorca. The Egyptian Sultan's request for aid undoubtedly accompanied proposals for peace, which El Mansur did agree to. The fact that he did not agree to lend Saladin his navy, however, does not detract from the Jerusalemite discourse in Saladin's letters. Indeed, historians like Amar Baj would not have been surprised if the Almohads had agreed to the proposal due to their common interests in jihad. Shared interest to the Maghrib, and, excuse me, shared interest between the Maghrib and Jerusalem did not cease with the Almohads and Saladin. For example, the former successors, the Marinids in Morocco, are known to have donated several Qurans to the Haram al-Sharif in the mid-14th century. The Haram al-Sharif is not the only building in Jerusalem with Iberian connections. Not far from the Muslim complex stands the Ramban Synagogue, a place of worship founded by the rabbi Demonides in the mid-13th century. I was fortunate enough to see this synagogue this summer before the horrible events of just a few weeks ago. Originally from Girona, Nemonides garnered great scholarly renown and participated in the 1232 Disputation of Barcelona against the Dominican Pablo Cristiani under the auspices of the Count King Jaume I. This landmark event in the history of religious polemic has been thoroughly studied by Jeremy Cohen, Robert Chasen, and Nina Caputo, among others, but much less attention has been paid to the disputation's aftermath. Who won the debate depends on what source you read, but Nemonides ultimately lost his home after publishing his account of the disputation. He was exiled from the crown of Aragon, and although he most likely could have settled in another Jewish community in Iberia or southern France, he chose to spend his last three years across the sea rebuilding the Jewish community in Jerusalem and Acre, which had been devastated by the Crusades, particularly the first, which ended in the widespread slaughter of Muslims and Jews within the city. Nemonides discusses the importance of Zion for Israel in many of his commentaries and other writings, but his reasoning comes out most clearly in his 1268 sermon for Rosh Hashanah. Quote, what's all this business about God's country? 
is not the whole world God's country. He created and formed all things, and all is his. But the land of Israel is the nub of the world, the Almighty's very personal and private estate that he manages directly. He appointed over it no heavenly custodian, no officer nor governor, when he did bequeath it to the people who proclaim the unity of his name, his darling seed. For Nimonides, Jerusalem was the place where the divine was most fully present, the place the Jewish people had inherited as God's chosen ones. Only there could Jews truly connect with the divine and fulfill the obligations of their scriptures. Nimonides therefore considered it a commandment or mitzvah for Jews to live and control the area. He was not alone in these thoughts. Other Sephardi Jews shared them, although few to the extent and with such vigor as Nimonides. Maimonides, who was born in Iberia but immigrated to Egypt to escape Almohad persecution and later became a physician of Saladin, also thought Jews should reside in and around Jerusalem. But he did not consider it a commandment in his Mishnah Torah. Judah Halevi too thought Zion was the only place to experience God's presence. For, quote, not every living creature is a human being. Not every human being is an Israelite. Not every Israelite is a priest. Not every priest is Moses or Aaron. Not every land is Canaan. Not all of Canaan is the gates of heaven. And not all the gates of heaven or Jerusalem, end quote. Jerusalem sits atop a hierarchy of holy places on earth for Halevi, and he wanted to inhabit it, indeed feel the physical Jerusalem. In the same letter from which the aforementioned quote came, Halevi quoted Psalm 102, you will arise and have mercy on Zion, for your servants take pleasure in her stones and cherish her soil. The city was not a metaphor or symbol for exile as it had been for so many other poets of the golden age of Hebrew poetry in Iberia. Like Saladin, Diego Gamirez, and so many of the other authors discussed in this paper, Halevi was concerned with the physical, not figurative, city of Jerusalem. He consequently rejected the courtly culture which made him famous and traveled to Jerusalem at the end of his life, perhaps on pilgrimage or perhaps to start a community like Nimonides. Historians can never be sure for Halevi died before reaching the city. But his memory reminds us of the many roads now forgotten laid between Iberia and the Holy Land in the Middle Ages. Sparked by the Crusades, they continued throughout the Middle Ages and indeed into the modern period. For in 1539, the Texcalans in New Spain, or modern-day Mexico, produced a theatrical production about the Christian conquest of Jerusalem. At the same time, it was a statement of the cultural destruction forced upon the indigenous of the Americas, a testament to indigenous agency, for the conquistadors were portrayed as the villainous Moors and Turks, and another forgotten road to Jerusalem. Thank you.